A whole new world. Friends in unlikely places. I never thought I'd be stealing with you again, Dubon muttered as he stood on the back of a wagon and threw a sack to Aladdin. Their latest caravan heist held no magic books, but something infinitely more useful to the poor people of Agrabah. Food. Aladdin grinned, catching the sack and making sure his top was knighted tightly. Street rats weren't the only kind of rat they had around here. I think Morgiana's idea is brilliant, to have Jasmine herself offering the handouts, Dubon said. It will make real connections with the people. It's dangerous, Aladdin said, scowling. Jasmine is too many things. A valuable prize to hand over to Jafar, a symbol of the old sultan, our de facto leader. I don't think she should be walking the streets out in the open. Dubon shrugged. You can't gain without risk, If all pe of you of all people should know that. The quiet noise of a throat being cleared interrupted their chatter. Aladdin and Dubon looked up in surprise to see a tall, middle-aged man standing there, quietly waiting. He was wrapped in a simple robe that was worn in places with what looked like a all-too-perfect rips. His face didn't show any of the long-term effects of privation. While he was skinny, it wasn't because he was starving. His skin was clear and sleek and his graying beard well-trimmed. His hands were clasped around each other politely. He wore a plain gold ring on one hand. But Aladdin's expert eye saw that it didn't quite match the tan lines around his finger, and there were pale areas on his other fingers. "'Were you just—' Aladdin began. "'My father runs a bakery,' Dubon said. "'We were just helping him. This is where he keeps his—' "'Baguettes,' Aladdin supplied. Aladdin looked at him as if he was an idiot, which he sort of was. "'I'm here to speak to the street rats,' the man said politely. His accent was clipped and refined. I don't know any, Dubon said. We aren't, Aladdin said. You're talking about those thieves they named the neighborhood after? Dubon asked with interest. A travesty, Aladdin swore, totally ruining property values. They trailed off as the man just watched him in silence. Finally, he spoke again. I am a Moor, the head of the Jewelers Guild, and I risk my own life by coming here. He twisted the gold band around on his finger and, as Aladdin suspected, revealed a huge gem in a bezel, an obsidian cabacone with the golden images of a perfect diamond incised in it. Dubon gave a low whistle. "'What is it you want?' Aladdin asked, confused. "'I would feel more comfortable discussing it over tea,' the man said, looking around obviously. The two thieves immediately felt stupid. Of course, a rich man who disguised himself to come to the most dangerous part of town would come with a purpose. He didn't want it exposed to the world. Yeah, of course, sure, Aladdin said quickly. But how did you know we were street rats? Or we were here? The man gave a polite cough and nodded his chin at a wall. There was the mark of Raja, four claws in bloody paint. Inside the labyrinth of passages that made up the world of the street rats, Dubon and Aladdin managed to cobble together some tea and chairs and a table, without leading a mirror or two deeply into their secret lair. The head of the jeweler's guild sat poshly relaxed, looking around with interest as if this was just a new tea house and not the lair of the people who probably stole from him and his clients. We should do something about that, Dubon suggested, Aladdin suggested to Dubon. The claw marks, I mean. The kids love it, Dubon said doubtfully. It really makes them feel like they're part of something. And here I was thinking you were concerned about security. I am, but it's a good symbol for people to rally to. They shouldn't, they just shouldn't paint it close to home. Amir took a sip of tea pointedly, waiting for them to sit down. Sorry, we can discuss this later, Aladdin said. No, it is a good symbol, the jeweler says. Maybe I'll have a couple made up in gold for those who support our cause. Our cause? Jasmine asked, entering the chamber. She pushed her disguise hood back from her face. Morgiana followed close behind. She scowled when she saw who sat drinking tea. Your Royal Highness, Amir said, leaping up and immediately ex exuding a perfect salam. There were rumors you were somehow connected with all this and hiding. The rumors are true, she said with a smile, indicating for him to sit down. She sat as well and took Aladdin's cup from him. He grinned and let her have it. I am gratified to see you are still alive and well. I uh, understand literally as well as figuratively, Amir said, and this leads us nicely to what I come here to discuss. I want to talk about the little situation Agrabah has with Jafar. 
Why do you care? Morgiana asked. He's not bothering you. He's not making you swear an oath of loyalty for bread. At night, when curfew tolls, you guys just stay inside your mansions and wait until morning. How is he bothering you? Amur gave her a withering look. Life isn't that simple, thief. Let's start with gold, for instance. I am sure that as a thief, you are aware of how much this magical influx of coins has devalued it. Aladdin chuckled, but not meanly. He's got you there, Morgiana. Jafar is ruining their trade, too. The second thing, Amir continued, and no less important. Jafar has closed all the libraries, all the religious education centers, and all the trade halls that deal with science or magic. The, Alch the Alchemax, I have it on good authority, are forbidden from meeting on, plain of, on pain of death. But why would we... Dubon began... Because he doesn't want competition, Morgiana said grimly. He's looking to break the laws of magic and doesn't want anyone stopping him. And of course, everyone who's educated knows how Jafar's benevolent rule ends, Jasmine said, nodding. It's true. Imams, mullahs, priests, rabbis, teachers, scholars, students, they are dissatisfied with the current state of affairs, to say the least, the jeweler said with a sigh. And you? Jasmine prompted. Amir steeled his fingers. Let us say I am representing them. I come to speak for a certain segment of the population, which includes the religious leaders and guilds and others in various quarters of the city. People you might not normally have discourse with, who have heard of some of the caravan raids and other exploits carried out by your little band of outlaws here, who are willing to support you in your endeavors as best we can. And they elected you to risk your sorry self down here? Dubon asked with a toothy grin. No, the man said calmly. I volunteered. Dubon had the decency to look abashed. But Amir wasn't done. You know, thief, you are not the only ones who value freedom. To do what you want where you want it with whom you want. To read what you want, if you can read. To live. I have a pair of granddaughters I used to walk with every morning up the hill past the cloth market to watch the sunset. It seems like such a little thing not to do anymore. But it matters. For them and for me, and even mansion walls do not keep out the fear of the night and the odious new things it brings. So we do the dirty work and you secretly support us? Morgiana demanded. Your talk about freedom is all well and good, but living, the freedom of that, is denied to many of the poorest in the city. Where are you before the bread vines when people are just hungry? It's a fair point, Amir allowed. But it's hard to gauge the severity of a situation when your, sor your sorry self, as your friend has nicely put it, is in danger every time you set foot in the poorer parts of town. When there is a well-organized gang of thieves bold enough to build start infiltrating the gem and gold markets. And that's a fair point, Jasmine said with a gentle smile. Can we perhaps agree that when this is all over, it is a problem we will all work on? Together? That Agrabah's problems are everyone's, and we need everyone's help? Amir and Morgiana glared at each other for a long moment. Yes, Amir finally allowed. All right, Morgiana said, but not quite sullenly. All right, Jasmine said with a re re relieved little sigh. It's past time. I got out there and start, start distributing bread to the families who have refused this whole swearing allegiance thing, who are starving because of the decision they made. Why don't you come along, Amir, and finally see firsthand the problems of a certain segment of the population of Agraba you're not acquainted with? Yes, I think that's a good idea, Amir said surprisingly, agreeable to the situation. And I'd like to help. Huh, Morgiana said. Princess Jasmine? The old woman said in wonder, looking up to her face. Half a dozen grandchildren scurried around her feet in various states of undress, trying to stay busy and play while their parents are gone. Jasmine stood before her like a, a succulent, head covered, offering a small bag of bread and cheese. Morgiana stood behind her, hands on her daggers. Behind them, Ahmed and Shirin carried more bags of bread. Amir had a giant one. Jasmine smiled. Yes, I've come to help. But aren't you marrying Jafar, the new sultan? No, she answered shortly. He's a murderous upsurfer. I will have my vengeance upon him and... Morgiana elbowed her discreetly in the ribs. And he and I don't see exactly eye to eye on matters of governance, Jasmine added quickly with a gentle smile. And he's turning Agrabah into a prison where everyone is scared of doing or saying anything wrong. The old woman continued to look at her with unreadable pale brown eyes. Jasmine tried not to grow nervous. 
He's an evil, murdering son of a pig, the old woman finally said, spitting. The old sultan may have been a fool who never did anything for us, but he never tortured anyone or demanded loyalty for bread. And what do the peacekeeping controls keep us safe from anyway? Each other? It's Agrabah. If you don't carry a dagger, it's your own damn foolishness. That's how I feel, too, Jasmine said. Mostly it'd be nice if the streets were free and safe. But please, take this bread and cheese. I am not demanding your loyalty in return. I just want my people fed. The old woman looked at the bread warily. Then her face broke into a smile of a thousand crinkles. She cackled. The royal princess, the future sultana, bringing me bread and cheese in my own home, and I didn't even have to get up and bow. Peace be with you, Jasmine said, nodding. And to you, the old woman said with dignity. And death to Jafar, she added with a mischievous grin, her hand swiping the air in front of her like a tiger's claw. When she walked back inside, Jasmine took a deep breath. She knew she should adjust her hood more tightly around her head, but she couldn't help taking it off for just a moment. She needed fresh air. It felt strange to have anything covering her so completely, but the rough material pulled at her hair and its new braided updo. I know, I know, she sighed, seeing Morgana's look. Just give me a second and thanks for the little reminder back there. I just think of Jafar and I get all crazy. It's like a rage that can't fit inside my own head. I want him to pay so badly for what he's done. I know, Morgiana said. The two girls strolled side by side down the shaded part of the street, away from the baking hot white wall on the other side. The rest of their team stayed a few steps behind, Ahmed and Shireen playing skip hop toss with a little stone, Amir looking around interestingly at the part of the city he had never been in before. Shireen had to pause her game to show him the right way to walk in the corner of the street rats, face straight and forward, eyes darting everywhere, not showing that, that you were staring. You look like a tourist, she explained with the patience of a much older teacher. Morgana watched him with a smile. Then she took a deep breath, trying to figure out how to say something politely to the princess. See, the thing is, none of us, none of the street rats, even most of the normal citizens of Agrabah, really care who's in charge. No offense or disrespect to your father, but except for taxes and jail, it doesn't really matter to the little guy. Jafar is playing a bad card with the patrols and increased violence. Nobody likes that, and you should bring that up often, but otherwise I would stress the details of regime change less than yay yay happy joy nice Sultana Jasmine who cares about her people more. You're right, Jasmine sighed, fixing her hair in preparation for putting the hood back up. Several people passed them and gave her a second glance. Most of the city has was now aware that Jafar hadn't wound up marrying the royal princess, and everyone wondered how she had gotten out of it and where she had fled to. In the poorer districts, rumors spread that she was among them somehow, but no one knew where and that she was helping the poor, like some sort of heroine out of a legend. Jasmine smiled at those who stared at her too hard. Although, she added with a sideways look at Morgiana, I am a bit surprised that you, of all people, had to remind me to speak of peaceful things. Morgiana grinned. Her face lost its characteristic tightness and scowl like she was dropping a costume or a heavy pair of boots. A lad may not approve of our little thieving organization and make fun of it, but what he fails to grasp is the organization part. It's not all about gold and jewels and heists and stealing from the man. It's also territories and percentages and fair trades, and not quite fair shares when somebody's family is ailing and needs a little more. It's about loans no one is ever going to pay back. It's about conflict resolution, because in our case, an unresolved conflict resolutions and daggers coming out. It's about dealing with people, treating them fairly, and listening to them even if you don't agree. Sometimes it's about making everyone unhappy the same amount. Jasmine listened with interest. I've only just begun to realize that myself. None of our plans, none of my plans to win the people, stop Jafar from breaking the laws of magic to overthrow him, would be possible without the network you have in place. Sorry about taking over. That's okay, Morgiana said, only a little ruefully. I truly believe that it's the only way to keep Agrabah from falling down a very, very bad path. What will you do when this is all over? Jasmine asked, realizing it was the second time recently she had asked someone that question. Morgana looked surprised. I don't know. You'll be Sultana, and I guess I can't go back thieving, now that you know everything about us. Amir was trying not to look like he was listening. I liked what you said before, Morgana said slowly. But everyone working together to make Ag Agrabah... 
She stopped short. Amir understood. I meant what I said about helping out, he protested, and I was merely interested in what you were going to say. I wasn't... No, look, Morgiana said, pointing without moving a muscle. Jasmine and Amir followed her eyes. One of the passersby didn't look twice at Jasmine. He looked three times, and then kept looking back. Jasmine wasn't sure what the big deal was, but Morgiana had tensed up and put her hands where her daggers were hidden. The man saw the three of them looking at him and broke into a run. It was like Morgiana had known he was, he was going to do exactly that. She sprang after him, almost before his legs moved. She let him just get far enough ahead so he could duck into a narrow, deserted alley of the street, probably thinking he could escape her there. Probably thinking that there would could easily subdue a girl so much smaller than he, where no one else could see. But he wasn't a street rat. Once they were alone in the alley, Morgiana doubled her pace and covered the last few steps in an astounding leap. She wrapped her arm around the man's throat and pulled him back to, er, into her. Her left hand held the dagger to his side. Jas Jasmine and Amir and the rest of the party rounded the corner just in time to see this. Amir drew back in shock. "'What's your problem, big guy?' Morgiana hissed in her captive's ear. "'Nothing. I'm on my way to the market. Nothing at all. Get off me!' the man ordered. "'Try again!' Morgiana dug the tip of her dagger deeper into his clothes so he could feel the prick of his, its point. She tightened her elbow at its neck. "'I am a citizen of the great Jafar's Agrabah. Agrabah Ascendant. Let me go, you street rat, or you will go poorly for you!' "'What were you doing staring at us like that?' Morgiana demanded. She twisted a knife so it began to tear, tear his tunic. "'Come now,' Amir began. "'He just recognized the princess and was surprised. Let him go!' "'Yeah!' The royal princess, the man said, choking a little. I was surprised. Morgiana seemed unconvinced. The man's hands flew up to his throat as he gave it a quick squeeze. I'll give you one more chance. Morgiana, please, Jasmine begged. Don't. Wait, what's that on his hand? Everyone stopped and looked. Sharan ran forward and grabbed his left arm, wrenching it so that the back of his hand was exposed. A strange symbol was burned in his skin so violently that it was still oozing and raw. The mark of Jafar, Morgiana spat, like on his coins and flags. Jasmine put her hand to her mouth, unsure if she was going to throw up or swear in frustration. Amir swore. My apologies, Morgiana, he growled. You know your business. You have the eye of a hawk. What is that? Jasmine finally asked, moving forward to get a closer look. The man's slitted eyes raced back and forth like a crazed horse's. He tried to scramble with his legs out but Ahmed st sat on them and held them together tightly. "'It's a brand,' Shirin said simply. "'Like what they do to goats.' "'Who did this to you?' Jasmine asked the man coldly. "'You get extra,' the man whined. "'The red light. He looks into you and sees that you really are completely devoted, and then you get the mark, and then you get meat and gold.' "'But what about the oaths?' Jasmine asked. "'Don't you get bread for just saying the oaths?' "'Everyone lies,' the man jeered. "'But I'm pure. I'm safe. I'm one of Jafar's men now. A branded one.' "'Dear heaven,' Amir murmured. "'Who did... when did this start?' "'I'm in the first hundred, the men bragged. "'Soon all of Agrabah will be pure, and I'm one of the first. "'He can't make them love him with magic or bread,' Jasmine said. "'So he's gaining their loyalty by torture and fear. "'Where is he doing this?' "'In the palace,' the man answered sullenly. It doesn't matter. I've seen you. I am the eyes and ears of Jafar. We'll have to kill him, Morgiana said. No, Jasmine said more tiredly than righteously. She thought quickly. What would Aladdin do? Lie. So Jafar knows I'm in the city. He probably already knew that. He doesn't know where I'll be next, because I never stay still. I never, never sleep in the same place. I move like the wind in the shadows. I'm sheltered by the good and faithful all over Agrippa, in every neighborhood. Go crawling back to your master, scum. Tell him that I am the eyes and ears of my people, and they do not want him. Morgiana dug the dagger in one more time, drawing blood. Then she let him go. In a series of clumsy, desperate flops, the man got up and ran away from them, sandals hitting the ground loudly. He didn't even shed a curse or promise back at them. Coward, a mere spat. Jasmine wanted to crumble to the ground. The smell of a recently burned flesh was still in her nose. The mark of Jafar hung in the air before her eyes, bloody and pale. Morgiana put her arm around the princess's shoulders. Jasmine, she said, I believe it's time to rethink our tactics. He's building his own power base, a strong one, with threats and rewards. You're right, Jasmine growled. 
This isn't some heist and hijinks resistance operation anymore. We can't wait in, around patiently to win the hearts and minds of all of Agrabah. We need to do more. We need to track, attack Jafar directly and take back Agrabah.